Hi, my name is Carlos Gutierrez. I am the co-founder and executive director of Cinema Tropical, and we want to welcome you to this very uh, special conversational series. And we have a great guest uh, with us tonight, a uh, filmmaker that we've uh, worked with her um, th throughout the years, and uh, I, I, I admire her work, and uh, she's a great example of how Latin American and US Latinx filmmakers have really transformed um, the, the landscape. Um, Natalia Almada, she was born in Mexico City in 1974 and she attended the College of Santa Fe and did a master's at the Rhode Island School of Design in photography. She has directed five potent and award-winning feature films, Al Otro Lado from 2005, El General from 2009, El Velador from 2011, Everything Else, her debut uh, fiction film from 2016, and more recently, Users, um, which uh, just had its world premiere at the Sundance Film Festival in January this year. She has actually also won the Sundance Documentary Directing Award twice for El General and Users, a uh, big achievement. And her work has been screened at numerous international film festivals, including Cannes, Directors Four Nights, Sundance, Rebecca, New York Film Festival, San Francisco, New Directors, New Films, uh, the Museum of Modern Art, the Guggenheim Museum, the Whitney Museum of Art, uh, and also on PBS's uh, POV series. She was awarded the MacArthur Genius Award in 2012, becoming the first Latina to win that uh, prestigious award. And she's won also numerous awards and fellowships, including the Albert Award, the United States Artist Fellowship, and the Guggenheim Fellowship, among many others. It's a great pleasure to have you with us, Natalia. Welcome. Gracias, Carlos. It's, it's nice to be here here wherever this is <laughs> it's a it's, it's it's really a great place right also um you know i think there's a lot of uh, things to celebrate uh, even though of course the context have been very difficult the past particularly past year um you know it's um you know, we're, we're taking advantage of this celebration of the 20 years of cinema tropical to to look back on on, on filmmakers like yourself that you know, it's pretty impressive that the careers that you have built, um, despite of all, all odds and all the challenges that you have faced, you you have built a very solid career, and and particularly it's a bigger achievement considering that even that in this country, um, you know, uh, there's very few U.S. Latinx filmmakers that have been able to to build such a, a solid career. But before we go, we talk about those challenges and how you have overcome them. Um, you know, I'm really curious about your your personal your your personal biography, your your upbringing. You know, you you grew up. Uh, in two countries, you grew up um, in two cultures, bilingual, and it seems that has completely informed your work. So can you tell us a little bit about your upbringing? Uh, sure. Um, well, first, it's great to be here because you've, I've worked with you on all my films. <laughs> so it's, uh, I feel very connected to Cinema Tropical, and I can see kind of in, our, in the way that we work together and in the challenges that we have faced as, as we've tried to put my films out in the world, uh, we can see how the landscape has changed and evolved and what the challenges have been. Um, so a bit about my background. I was born in Mexico City, but my father was from Sinaloa. And I grew up <coughs> spending about half my time in Sinaloa. My father had a cattle ranch, so kind of in a ranch life, very wild. And uh, my mom, um, we lived in the States moved a lot and so I never really felt rooted in any single place in the U.S. but I did do most of my school in the States and um, I think I've just always felt more Mexican and more at home in Mexico mostly because we went back to the same place and because I had a bigger family in Mexico and a kind of sense of roots and continuity uh, with my life there um, but I think you know, in terms of, as a filmmaker, I think it's, uh, there are two different things that we're gonna talk about. And I think one is my kind of gravitation towards film as a medium coming <laughs> out of a bicultural experience. And so I think when you grow up kind of, I mean, I was a kind of, I won't call it schizophrenic childhood, but I was American in the US with my mom and I was Mexican in Mexico with my dad. So that's a very kind of different immigrant experience or Latin American, Mexican American, whatever we call it, it's kind of um, more divided. It wasn't such a mixture of cultures. It was really living two cultures in parallel. 
And I think out of that came a kind of, you could say a mistrust of language on the one hand mm -hmm. and a trust in images or looking for images as a way to make sense of the contradictions and the, uh, yeah, the, the, that reality of having two cultures that don't combine. And then I think moving forward into kind of adulthood and, and once I, I mean, in a lot of ways, I didn't even identify as Latina in the US because I didn't see, I didn't know that world and I didn't understand how I fit into it or, and once I did come probably my college and, and graduate school years, um, anyways, I think that then my work fell into a very different position into uh, that is that that world. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, it, and, and growing up, did you see it as, a, as, as, as an identity problem or, or you felt really comfortable kind of uh, navigating these two very different worlds? Um, I felt very comfortable navigating those worlds. I had been in therapy forever, <laughs> which I can <laughs> see that maybe there were some identity issues that, around, that came out of, of that duality. Um, and it's a duality that was all in all regards. It was also economic. It was a lot of, it wasn't just two different cultures. It was a lot of things. Sure. Um, yeah. And actually, uh, no, I was going to say, uh, in an interview, um, in an old, older interview, I saw that you, you uh, that you kind of rejected this kind of idea of being half Mexican, half American, that rather, why, why not 100% Mexican, 100% uh, American at the same time? And, and, and... Well, because I think in retrospect, I came to see that there was always kind of a half of me that was not present, or that I was maybe not consciously, but hiding. So when I was a kid, I remember, you know, typical Mexican style, kind of half jokingly, I'd be called a pocha or, you know, these terms that are pretty quite derogatory um, because I'd make a mistake speaking in Spanish or something about what I did was so American, right? So I kind of learned, I think, in both places to hide a half of myself. And mm -hmm. And later I was just thinking how ridiculous it is of a concept. Like you're, you're fully whatever you are. <laughs> you can't be half a culture. You are, even if you have two, you are both those things fully instead of thinking oh, I'm half this and half that. So you were saying that uh, the images, that's what uh, attracted to you. So that's what um, um, uh, led you to study photography. That was your kind of first inclusion into the visual, uh, the visual arts. I think so. I mean, I, I started taking photographs when I was quite little. And I, mean, I remember I got my mom gave me my first camera when I was like 12 or something. And I wanted, I would go out with my mom and photograph people on the street in Chicago. Um, so I just think there was something about the camera as a, a thing that gave me permission to observe in a way that I didn't feel I had without it. And then you studied, you studied, uh, you did a master's actually in photography, right? Uh, the Rhode Island, Rhode Island School of Design? Right. So I did my master's, yeah. So, uh, I, so. I did my, my thesis was a film called All Water Has a Perfect Memory, which is a short film that was at Sundance. Um, mm -hmm. And I, it was funny, I was in grad school and somebody stole out of my house all my camera equipment. Hmm. And I never got another still camera, like a real one, wow. since then. And I just started making films. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, and, 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 so, and, and tell us a little about, about the program. Uh, so uh, it was kind of a liberal arts kind of thing, or, or how, how did the, from photography you, you were able to, to jump into, 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 into filmmaking? Uh, well, this was, so I went to RISD, I started in 1999 to 2001. And the program at RISD at the time was a very conceptual program. We were five or six students. Um, and I don't think anybody took photographs. Hmm. But we all thought photographically. So the kind of theory and the thinking behind whether it was performance or installation or, or video or uh, 
was always framed around the discourse that you have in photography. And I, I found that really interesting. And, and to this day, I, I mean, I love making films, but it's not because I'm so tied to the medium. Like there's something else I love about what it affords me in terms of exercising all the different parts of my brain. Um, but I, I would be fine to take photographs or write or do something different. Like I don't think, oh, I'm a filmmaker and, and I, it's the only medium I could ever work in, <laughs> even though it is the only one I've done. <laughs> Although you have also a jump a little bit into the visual arts now. Did, did you do a one channel installation or uh, transform El Velador? Well, we can talk about the Velador. Yeah, we did. Um, I mean, but that's a different, a different thing. I, I, we did a, a rendition of El Velador as an installation. Mm -hmm. It was an incredible experience, and I would love to do more things like that. Um, we also showed Al Otro Lado in the Whitney Biennial. Um, oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, so I've, I've shown work in the art context, and I, I enjoy making work that can be seen in that world. And at the same time, it's interesting to think of a film like the, well, the ones I've made, El Velador and Al Otro Lado, that showed a lot in museums and also showed on PBS, right? And you kind of think like, oh, those two worlds don't, they can't coexist. Like they're such a different spaces. And so it's interesting the way an audience is kind of um, trained for what they're gonna see, whether it's in a museum or in a, on television. And as a, as a filmmaker, it's really rewarding to, to get to get those responses to the same work and, and see how it works differently. In that sense, kind of mirrors also your cultural, what were you talking about, about also about your cultural, yeah. having these, these different dualities, but then um, that get enriched from, from both sides. Huh? Would, you, would you say this in the same case with fiction and nonfiction? Because you, you, know, you, you, you think you incorporated fictional elements in your nonfiction, you already, you made a fiction film. You, also, you, know, you, you like also exploring the, those limits as well. Yeah, I think it's true for genre as well. Um, you know, just I think of especially the film I just did, Users, it takes a lot, lot of science fiction documentaries and fiction elements. Um, and you can, depending on how you choose to frame it, the viewer is going to come to it differently. And, you know, and I think if you look at kind of film festivals around the world, there are those festivals that don't make those distinctions. Right, so you have a festival like Sundance that has a documentary program and the fiction program, but new directors, new films, or a lot of the Latin American festivals, they combine everything into the same, pro you're just in the program, you're in it or you're not in it. <laughs> and it's all film. And okay. I find that to be more interesting. In that sense, which, which are like a, a more challenging barriers, uh, the cultural barriers between the U.S. and Mexico, or the or the or the uh, industry barriers between fiction and nonfiction? Oh, I guess they're all the same in the end. And I think the the trick is, I think it's two things. It's one figuring out how to see what the barrier is, right, and how to look at that structurally. So it's not personal. Right? It is about the structures and the, the power dynamics that exist around the structures. And sure. I think once you can understand that, then it's easier to play with them and to own them in a way that's less painful. I think when you don't see what it is, what that barrier actually is, and I think of kind of a young filmmaker just starting kind of experiencing those barriers, but not fully cognizant of where they're coming from, I think they can be very devastating. Sure. Going back to your um, thesis, short film, All Water Has a Perfect Memory, which, you know, since then you, um, that bend, that genre bending between fiction and fiction is, is present and, and experimented with the form. Um, and as we were saying, the, the film played at Sundance and played at numerous film festivals. Uh, what was your experience with that, with the short film? And, and then suddenly, traveling to all these different film festivals with this experimental work? It was, I mean, I, I didn't study film. And I had a professor who, who just said, well, send it to these festivals. I didn't really know what Sundance was. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I really literally stuck it in a mailbox. <laughs> and that was it. 
And I remember I had this terrible temp job. And I got a call when I was at my temp job from Sundance, you know, saying your film is in the festival. And it was just like crazy. You know, that. <laughs> um, and I think in a lot of ways that gave me a lot of faith in the film world because I didn't have connections. I didn't go to film school. I didn't have someone make a call for me, right? I didn't have a network. Um, and they just, someone saw it. Someone looked at it in that pile of mail. <laughs> and that is incredible. Like, that's incredible that you can get your foot in the door into such a prestigious festival out of nowhere like that. You know, and, and over the years, I've come to see that's rare in a lot of ways, especially if you have a feature and mm -hmm. you have to do more lobbying and more work than that most of the time. But it was a fantastic introduction. And, and back then, was uh, was still your submissions on VHS or was already <laughs> on DVDs? I can't remember. It was it like a long time ago. I can't remember. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, it was still VHS, isn't it? Yeah, it was the 2002 Film Festival. Yeah. Well, and I were open before a short uh, feature. Um, and my film was so quiet, which was the other thing I had never <laughs> thought about. I really hadn't envisioned the film in a theater. And so I just remember being in the theater and being, my film is so quiet, you could hear everything. <laughs> and it was very nerve-wracking. What's a pretty amazing about that short film is like a very, it's a, it's a very a solid and accomplished short film. And I think it still stands up through so many years. Uh, tw actually, it's uh, 20 years. Uh, no, well, you finished it 20 years ago. Almost, yeah. pr almost, pr almost premiered 20 years ago. Uh, what what influences so how do you how do you how, how are you able to, to to master that format already uh you know have, have that mastery about the language to create that such a solid work I, mean, I feel very grateful that i didn't go to film school and it's because i was in such a free environment to think about what film could be and to not even have the goal of making a film but to work with the medium and um it's the film in a lot of ways I'm still most proud of. And it's a film that is a kind of uh, basic premise. It's a film about the death of my sister and she drowned when she was two and I was just an infant. So I wanted to kind of bring together my family's memories for myself and create one. And I remember when I told my dad, I had this idea to make a film <laughs> about, about this and he's like, well, you, you can't make that film. Like, that's just not a film, because what are you going to film, right? And, and I just often think about that as, as a, an interesting place from which to think about what you can make films about. Sure. And it gives me courage when I think, like, who's, who's ever going to want to watch that film? It's a terrible pitch, right? <laughs> and, and yet, it has worked. And it, had, like you said, I'll still show it sometimes. It still has some relevance, and so it gives me we'll get back. Me faith. We'll get we'll get back to the pitching aspect of, <laughs> of documentary world. But um, I'm curious, uh, why is the film that you're the most proud of? Because it's the most unlikely, hmm. right? It it doesn't. It's made mostly out of audio recordings. Um, it has, it's not a logical film. Like the images that I made are, are not logical. Like it, they're, there's a few repeating images. One is like a spinning dress. One is um, a needle of a sewing machine. Um, I used one, of, I think one, a couple pieces of a movie, but not a lot. One photograph that repeats. So it's just not, it's not your tip. Like if someone said, what's the story or what's, the story structure, like all of those things are kind of not present in that film, and yet it works. And so it's in Spanish, it's in English, it has lots of black, it has no <laughs> music. Um, so that's why I'm proud of it, because it's um, it's the most free. Hmm. And well, we'll get that also back, back to artistic freedom. But so, um, you know, after the success of, of, of your short film, um, then you, you, you made your, your first time. Uh, uh, feature film, Al Otro Lado, to the other side, which in 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 a way is is the most um, your most straightforward uh, film. You're, 
So, um, how can you tell us how how you decided to make that uh, your first feature film, uh, and how did you connect it with the story with uh, the narco corridos and uh, and immigration, which at the time, um, 2004, when you shot it, uh, premiered 2005, nobody was putting both um, both um, subject matters together. You know, they were completely separate topics. Yeah, I'm going to backtrack for one second. Sure. That one thing I'll say about making my short is that I uh, was introduced to Lourdes Portillo, and I bring it up because mm -hmm. you had your talk with her last week. Yep. And <laughs> For me, like seeing her work opened up this whole world of possibility of what a film could be, especially seeing The Devil Never Sleeps, right? Which is just such an incredible, crazy piece of work and and realizing that there was like this whole movement of Chicano film and women's film that I had never known. And so and anyways, it was just a really important aspect of making all water, but also kind of understanding where my, I might go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with Al Otro Lado, um, in a lot of ways it came most out of my experience growing up in Sinaloa where it was like everything and everybody was always talking about El Otro Lado. And so whether it was the fishermen talking about selling their shrimp or the drug, drug traffickers taking their drugs to the, the U.S., or people crossing to work, it was like the, the theme. <laughs> and um, so it seemed normal, or not exactly normal, but and also at the time, there were a few other doc documentaries out that were about the immigrant experience in the US. And I think of Farmingo, it's the main one that comes to mind. I don't know if you remember that film. Sure, Carlos mm -hmm. Yeah, but there was a few films I feel that looked at the experience in the US. And I felt that in the discourse, there was this kind of lack of images and information about why people would come to the US or what the experience was in Mexico. Um, and I felt that there was a lot of misconceptions <laughs> that and there's a lot of <laughs> Anyway, so I felt there was, I had a, just really wanted to make that film that would portray things from the Mexican side. And uh, one of the things that was important, there were two things that were important to me. One was, how do you make a film about other people in which they really have a voice, right? So I'm not making, writing their narration. I'm not interviewing them all the time. And, and the music was a way to have that voice that's organically about the people that the film is about. Um, and then the other thing is that when you're filming people who, you know, like in this case, you're, you're looking at someone, at, at immigrant community that, um, how, do you, how do you make them, how do you portray their fullness, right? That they're not just their problem. And culture is a great way to do that. And that this is, that these people are in a situation, but they are not devoid of kind of cultural roots and identity and, and all those things. And the music represents that, sure. right? There are people who have a music is another way to think about it. Um, so for both those reasons, I felt like the corrido was the perfect way to kind of talk about immigration and drug trafficking. <laughs> and then, and then, you know, that's all you hear in Culiac, in Sinaloa. And my family had a hotel in Culiacan where the Tigres started playing in the 70s. Before they were famous, they were just young, <laughs> starting out musicians. They would come and play at the, at the, the bar disco of the hotel. <laughs> so, wow. kind of family connection that was amazing. That's how you had access to them? Uh, I mean, also, I mean, you feature uh, Los Tigres Norte, but also, uh... Uh, uh, you feature uh, Jenny Rivera when um, she was, you know, starting her career, or like she was about to become a really, really, really famous. Uh, the late uh, Jenny Rivera. Uh, well, I started with Los Tigres del Norte, and uh, I think when I introduced myself as Natalia Almada, they recognized the name. <laughs> that was the, the <laughs> in. And then from there, um, 
I worked with a writer named Elijah Wall who wrote a book mm -hmm. called Nato Corrido. Mm -hmm. And he kind of guided me on who the important you know, musicians were in the Corrido world and helped make introductions and really helped me kind of with that aspect of the film. What's cr crazy looking back in retrospective, again, the film premiered 2005, just one a little more than a year later, you went two years later, the Mexican government really declares not only the war to cartels, but also the war to medical culture. Or like they put the, the whole culture that you were portraying as also kind of the enemy of the people. Uh, it's kind of interesting, you no? Know, how they use it against the people, not against that, or that was a scapegoat against the bad, bad policies, no? Yeah. I mean, I think you could, there were, when I was filming already, cases of music that was being censored and um, and there was, like I shot at the at the cemetery where I made El Velador. Mm -hmm. I shot there in, the, in, in Al Otro Lado. Um, I just remember um, an, an anecdote, um, just remind me if I'm correct. That when you were looking for funding for for El Otro Lado, um, that on the, yes on this um, feedback notes uh, that somebody told you that you were not the right person to tell it, or what was the? Uh... Oh, I had such a bad time raising funds for El Otro Lado, and yeah, you know, it was my first film that I was ever writing a proposal for, raising money for, um, and I actually didn't get any money. Any, and I got I had a a knife uh, artist grant, which was like seven thousand mm -hmm. dollars or something which isn't much in a film budget. Sure. Um, but I got my first check from public television when I was already color correcting the film. So hmm. it was rough. <laughs> um, but yes, so one of my feedbacks, because when I was pitching the film, I would uh, often feel this need to explain things. Like I couldn't just say I was making a film about Sinaloa because nobody who is going to be reading my proposals would know where Sinaloa was or about corridos because nobody knew what corridos were or so I often had this you know which I think is common this kind of need to explain everything um which makes for a very dull proposal <laughs> but in in that process at some point I I received some feedback saying that the way in which I was presenting corridos to a mainstream American audience was not correct. <laughs> um, which is a horrible thing to be told, you know, it, because at the end of the day, it is my culture. I, I grew up with corridos. I, <laughs> I am not a, I'm not from a drug trafficking family, but <laughs> it, right. it, it's the world I grew up in, you know. What you were saying, but you know, it's not. But it's not all. It's not only about writing the grants. Um, a lot of the times, uh, for Latin American, U.S. Latinx film filmmakers are asking also to to be very specific in their narrative. So, you know, all, that you have to put Sinaloa in the map in the film to explain to people. Uh, how have you um, dealt with it? Uh, you know, the, have to how to avoid being didactic in your films versus all this push. From the funders and uh, you know a lot of people in the, in the in the film world asking filmmakers to be very specific because otherwise to, to explain the cultural specificity of the projects i think it's, it's a little bit what we were saying at the beginning it's understanding what's structural so um i think that funders or they they want that kind of certainty because they're uncomfortable with all these things that they might not know and that they're unfamiliar with. Also important, I think, is to recognize that when someone doesn't know something, they tend to think it's not important, right? If something's not on my radar, it must be because it's not that relevant in the world, so why would you fund a film about that thing, sure. right? Um, however, if you think about most of the films that you love, or most of the art, or most of the music you love, your entry point to it is most likely not informative, right? You, you, you fall in love with something because it seduces you one way or another, like it's a beautiful image or it's mysterious or it's something, but it's not usually logic. Um, and so if, if you hold on to that idea and trust it, 
then the goal becomes how do I entice you rather than inform you? And if I can entice you, the information will come and you'll accept not knowing as I, as I take you through this journey, you know, whether you'll find out or not. <laughs> Does that make sense? Sure. And then, but in that sense, uh, do you see a separate process in terms of how you pitch and how you present a proposal for a film versus what what happens at the end with the movie, with the film? Um, do you have a lot of room to maneuver uh, in terms of what you present and ultimately what becomes? Because I'm also thinking, and that's probably a good, good segue to talk about like in general, but pitching in general uh, must have been a very difficult project to pitch. Um, and just to just to finish, the idea, I always think of uh, Patricio Guzman, who, you know, he always mentioned that uh, he went, started pitching uh, uh, Nostalgia for the Light. Nobody funded the film because, you know, nobody understood what he was trying to do with the SE format and, and bring all these elements. And so he basically self-funded. Uh, his wife produced the film. And, uh, but then, you know, became such a landmark film. And that's kind of the, kind of the contradiction of cinema. You know, cinema is, is made about films that break the mold. But then <laughs> when you go to, when you go to funding and you go to uh, you know to pitching, it's about filling certain certain molds as well. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe I don't know if it's because I've made enough films now that I'm less inclined to stay in the frustration of getting the funding, <laughs> and I I or even the distribution or or the the right press or whatever it is or or. And, and I, I guess I feel like funding, trying to raise money for a film is a drag and, and the odds are against you no matter what. And so how, you know, it, it, it's a little bit what I was saying before. It's, a, it's more a thing of, like I know these things, right? I know that the funder is not gonna think that my Mexican film is important. I know that they're not gonna know an th a lot of things about it. Um, so, so give it up, give that up. Don't even try to solve that problem, but rather hold on to the thing which I know that I can communicate as, as relevant. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, Bas basically selecting, the, selecting which fight you want to. Yeah. No? Managing yeah. your creative energy to the things that are important for you, I guess. Yeah. Yes, and feeling like you actually have a lot of control in those proposals. You know, it's that typical thing that people say, like, you don't have to answer the interview question, you say what you want to say. <laughs> it's the same in a proposal, like you have to figure out how to say what you want to say through their question. But what's important isn't to answer their question exactly, it's to say the thing that is true about your project um, and the thing that you believe in. And, and if you have that conviction behind what you're doing, it's not that hard, right? So if you can bring bring that, that kind of confidence and clarity to the forefront, rather than, because what happens is if you're just trying to ans answer somebody else's question and that somebody else doesn't know your project, they don't actually know what to ask. Right, so so there's just a way to flip it a little bit that is, for me, has been important to make it less discouraging. So from a, a sort of, a, to call it a, describe it a more straightforward documentary, uh, of a lot which, you know, uh, uh, was pretty impressive also the success of the, of the film and, and, you know, the film had a one week run at, at MoMA and, uh, and, uh, and actually it was, remember, Perfectly that night, uh, and, and 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 you brought the protagonist, uh, Magdiel. It was a very special, very special screening, and then you know the film uh, traveled a lot. But from that film, then you you decided to take um, uh, a big risk, I guess, to make a a, a more let's call it experimental film, um, uh, and adopt more the essay format. Um, what was how, how how did that project come about, uh, in general? I actually thought I would make El General first. No. Uh, because I got these audio recordings that my grandmother made about her, she was going to write a book about her father, who was president of Mexico in the 20s. And the audio, the tapes just kind of got put away. No one listened to them. And then when I made my short film, uh, they were given to me because 
someone thought I could make something with them. <laughs> and and I had them, and I was trying to figure out what I would do with it with with those tapes. Um, and I don't know why Al Otro Lado kind of slipped in there first, but it was an easier film to make in a lot of ways. I mean, Al Otro Lado was challenging because it also wasn't a single story. It had a main character, but then it had the music and the immigration and kind of all these different threads uh, interweaving around the story of this one guy who, um, who ends up crossing the border. Uh, and El General in that regard isn't that different in terms of it being a kind of all these different threads interweaving together. So El General has my grandmother's voice. It has a narration that I wrote. It has contemporary footage of Mexico. It has archival footage. Um, it has kind of man on the street interviews. And then it has the footage that we shot on 16 millimeter film. So it has a score. <laughs> so it's, um, it's in the same regard, it's a very, um, not collage film, but in some ways you know, it has all these different elements. But, you know, but, uh... You know, it was kind of a, it was kind of a, an ambitious project in terms of creating that collage, because, uh, and and that's what I, I'm, 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 uh, you know, admire your career. You, 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 in each film, you, you, you're taking risks. Um, you're taking art, uh, artistic, artistic risks in terms of, uh, in terms of, um, particularly in terms of the form. Um, you're really pushing yourself to the limit. So, how do you, how do you take, how do you say to take those risks in terms of form? Well, El General, um, it's funny because I had my first residency at McDowell right mm -hmm. after finishing El Otro Lado and right when I was starting El General. So I went there and I hadn't shot anything yet. And McDowell, you know, it's this amazing residency program in New Hampshire. It was February, so it's snowy and you get a cabin in the woods. Right. <laughs> now, I would sit in this cabin in the woods listening over and over to my grandmother's tapes. And it was really like being transported in time. And, and for me, it was like getting to talk to my grandmother as an adult. And, and she just came to life for me. And I feel like in that, in those six weeks that I was at McDowell, I just, more, uh, maybe more than any time, I like went into some kind of trance. <laughs> mm. And I was in, in the film all of a sudden, like I was just was going. You know, and, and I started writing and, and working with a voiceover of my own and and it just it just figured it out there. And there was something about that experience, which is also kind of contradictory for what the film is, that felt like this this film is not just about the past. It is it it has to be in the present because I'm in the present and they're existing for me in the present. And so it's shaping the way I see, you know, it's Mexico in 2006, we had elections, it was a crazy time. So her voice was, was always with me as I was seeing what was happening. Um, and that really guided how I made the film, like the decision to have a contemporary side, the decision mm -hmm. to include my voice. Um, and then it became a really fun film to make because it was like a game of, of stream of conscience. And I had just moved to Mexico City as an adult, had my first apartment that was mine in Mexico City. And it was right next to this hospital that had this massive mosaic of, of a virgin on the wall against my building and a spinning stench, statue of Cantinflas. Right, I remember that. You know, Yes, yeah, so I would walk by there and, and there was the statue and then the whole having to get my gas delivered and waiting for like the sound of the gas delivery. It was just amazing. And all those things kind of, I would, I would be like, I know this is the life of this film. And then the game would be like, how do I take you there? How do I, what does Cantinflas have to do with my grandmother? And what does that gas delivery man have to do with Calles? And, and to kind of make those connections in space and time was, was a fantastic game. The, the, the film is also, I mean, uh, for me, one uh, another important element of a film is that I think it's part of a generation of Latin American filmmakers that talk about privilege and and and, and the political families from within that, you know, traditionally 
you know, uh, filmmakers would would not would would not uh, the previous generations would not necessarily talk about those issues or and the power was very secret secretive. Uh, everything happened, you know, in, in, inside. Uh, so the film really opened opened the doors. It's kind of ventilating the house. Um, in, in that sense, uh, did you w was there a very different re um, reception for the film in Mexico than in the U.S. or how do you how do you see it in that regard? Yes, I mean I think the film. I, you know, I remember I had a screening. I want to say it was in Chile. And somebody in the audience said, like, I hope one day we can look at our history this way. Or So I think the film resonated in Latin America in one way, where there we have certain shared histories. And I think it's more kind of conceptual side in that it looked at how memory and history are kind of fabricated, um, allowed it to work in the US or in Europe. So, and I knew that making the film, I was aware of the kind of, and, and it's something I think about all the time, like kind of thinking about the, the access to the film in layers. And so, um, when you give a piece of information, if you're speaking to an audience who already knows that information versus somebody who doesn't and how it's gonna feel differently. So how do you choose what information is essential for everybody? What can be like the insider knows? Mm -hmm. So anyways, those kinds of layers are something, it's something I think about a lot. Uh, especially and then, you know, in, in general. And then with the general, you, you win your first, uh, directing a word at Sundance. Uh, did that open a lot of doors? And in that sense, uh, you even push the form more with your next film with El Velador. Uh, you went even more um, severe in, in, in terms of uh, in terms of pushing the form to the extreme. Uh, no, after El General, I was so exhausted <laughs> <laughs> from, from dealing with all these things. like. The score was really hard to do, and, and it was hard working with all the musicians, and all the archival footage was hard to get the rights, and it was hard to, you know, transfer it. All the, everything was so hard. So I said, I'm gonna make a film that's really basic, like me and my camera, and that's it. So that because I I don't want music, I don't want archival <laughs> footage, I don't want a voiceover, I don't want. Um, so it's very reactionary to El General. Um, <laughs> And I, I remember I just woke up one morning remembering the cemetery where I had filmed in El Otro Lado and wondering, like, well, what's it like today? Because so this was 2009. I started filming and we were having an increase. It was when we started doing these tallies of how many people had died because of narco violence. And it was just like in the news every day. Sure. And I can't remember the numbers at the time, but it seemed like this is insane. Like, how could this? How could this be? And it's crazy to think that those numbers just, right. yeah. Yeah. So I went back to that cemetery and I thought, well, this is gonna be a very easy film because I'm gonna just film the construction <laughs> of a mausoleum. Right, from, and I'll have a cast of characters and I have a perfect arc, like it's super easy. <laughs> that was the, <laughs> And and I quickly there was a lot of things I realized. Is one is it's not that interesting to watch something be built. And then secondly, it's not the same four people building that thing. Like there's one person who puts the floor, another person who does the glass, another person, and they don't all know each other and work together all the time. So you don't really have this, like what I thought would be like this family of workers working on this project. And then it's. It just was such a, a crazy place to be. Um, and the constant there was the velador, the kind of overseer who spent the nights there. Um, so I just started spending more time with him. In, in many job, ways, it was, sorry, he job was too. His job was so so meaningless in a lot of ways. And he just was there, but he couldn't really do anything. 
you know, he'd say things like, oh, it's best not to go there because <laughs> there's something happening. So we'll just stay here. <laughs> so it was like, <laughs> he was the security guard who didn't really guard anything, but he observed <laughs> everything. And, and he's from that corner position of the cemetery he had and kind of watching it kind of grow and, and the life at the cemetery. In in, in, in in that sense, actually, uh, what's very find very interesting about the Velador is like a, it's an anti narco film, and uh, and it's pretty uh, impressive uh, how you deconstruct basically all this discourse of violence and and again we talk about what um, 2009 10 when you were filming uh, it was pre narcos the series uh, you know and all those all those even Hollywood films that you know that also brought narco violence and narco culture to a larger um, uh, global audience. But you know, I, I'm very interested in, in, in terms of uh, how, um, you know, how to document violence without being complicit. And I think that's at, at the core of the film, right? Yeah, I mean, I read a ton on violence, like all the, when with all my films, I tend to kind of have a, a theoretical position and, you know, when we talk about research, and my research for El Velador was all about how violence works and how images of violence work. Mm -hmm. And so I was very committed to making a film that was about violence without being violent. And, you know, I felt, it's not that I have exactly an affinity or sympathy with the perpetrators of the violence but I could just so much see their reality and what led to that violence and see it as a kind of societal problem. And when the Mexican government was doing things like using the military against the narcos, that means there's no, um, there's no legal system, there's no trial, it means that if, if, if somebody decides that you're a narco and wants to shoot you, they have permission to do so, right? So those people were getting, losing all their rights. They are um, portrayed as monsters by society. And therefore, I am not responsible, right? I as a citizen right. have nothing to do with that thing, right? And that is a terrible, situation for the whole society to have mm -hmm. one part of society not care about another part of society and to lose your um, your uh, derechos, your, right, uh, your legal right. system of rights, mm -hmm. and sure. that somebody can declare a part of your society to not have rights, right? And, and we can look at lots of examples of that around the world. Um, and I think it's always wrong. Even if you're looking at people who, who are doing something that's illegal and who are committing acts of violence, there's a reason for those things or why people take that path. And when you would walk around the cemetery, everybody buried there is under 30. It's, so it's devastating. Wow. And it's devastating to see you know, a, a party at a cemetery of people in their 20s who are basically they're celebrating in part because they know that they're next, right? It, it's, and so how, so I felt like the real violence is that, it's kind of the sadness and the, the loss of life, the loss of young people's lives, the, the lack of, even the ability to imagine a future for yourself, is, is that's what I could see the cemetery. And so I really felt that that was the violence that we needed to talk about. And that the violence that we experience is often about, it's fear, to live in a state of fear, to be afraid that somebody's gonna shoot you, to be afraid, you know, to live in, in, a, in a society where there is so much violence. It's the fear. So how to also create in the film that anticipation of any moment here, something might happen. Right. So those were the the things and the ideas that I was feeling and thinking about. 
you were shooting basically in the Lions den. Was it dangerous uh, to spending the time there at that it cemetery was. in those years? It, it definitely was. And I think, I, I mean, I was with a person who worked with my dad as like his kind of on the ranch. Cause, so I was, he and I would go together and he was more like my, my bodyguard. He had a big truck. <laughs> so he fit in a little bit more and we had an agreement that if he said we need to leave, he just left. I, like there was no pushback on my end. Like I'm in the middle of a shot, or <laughs> um, and and the workers kept me safe just by being with them. Uh, in the end, I was threatened, and that's why I stopped shooting. And in a lot of ways, I think that experience of being threatened shaped how I cut the film a lot. I, I suddenly understood something very clearly that before had only been an idea. Theoretical. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, it also um, shook me a lot in terms of the relationship between filmmaker and subject and funders and distributors, et cetera, because there are a couple things. There was a time when there was this big push on measurable outcomes, mm -hmm. right? Grassroots it's, outcomes. Which is still pretty he hegemonic, no? It hasn't changed that much. No? Probably yeah. then was booming, but still kind of stayed hegemonic, no? Yeah, maybe it was when it, I don't know if that's when it kind of started, so it felt like this big push. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, and, you know, I, I had gotten support from PBS, from POV, that came on board really early, which was amazing. Um, so I knew I had to get my releases and things like that, but when you're working in places, one where most of the people you're filming can't read and write. You can't present them with a three page release or a one page sure. release. <laughs> um, and then I was very aware of the kind of class and social differences that when I would ask somebody if I could film them, they probably didn't really feel that they could say no, unless it was a threatening no. Right, but any, but otherwise, most people were going to say yes to me, and that I could say like, oh, I'm making a documentary, and the velador, the night watchman, probably didn't really have a context for what I was talking about, or it's going to go to film festivals. Like, does it mean anything to him? So these releases, which I think are intended to guarantee that the person being portrayed in a film has agreed to be in a film that contract doesn't really hold true. You need to have a different contract, right? So when I got threatened and the people who had worked with me by extension were threatened, I just kind of the weight of the responsibility fell on me a lot. And I recognized that, yes, I had gotten permission, but I don't think that the people who gave me permission were totally aware of what they were giving me permission to do. Not 100%. And so what do you do with that? And then what do you do with the kind of push afterwards? Like somebody said to me once, uh, you know, we'll give you all this outreach money if you show the film to mothers who have disappeared children. And I was just like, I can't do that. Like. I made this film, but I wouldn't know how to talk to those mothers. And like, it just didn't feel like it was my, my role, my place. I felt like it would be insulting. Um, so there's something just there about this, that, that relationship, like how do you take care of the people you're filming? How do you bridge that gap between, you know, what, what they know and the world that they know and the world that the film might exist in. And then how do you communicate all of that complexity to a funder or a distributor or, <laughs> you know, and they have their own set of, of rules and guides and things that they think sure. should happen. Um, but in that sense also, you know, you talk about the impact um, and also, you know, uh, I was saying that how it became so hegemonic in terms of how measuring the impact of a film, but you know, I see your films, and 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 your films have have had a very big impact. It's really hard to measure 
because it's not about you know it's, it's not a, it's not only how many people saw it it's it's about changing the narratives and that's so difficult to measure to have a you know a numeric outcome in terms of because I, I probably I, I I see that a big problem in the nonfiction world particularly in the U.S. Uh, you know, um, we're talking about certain topics, but it's not only talk, talking about the topics, it's how we're talking about the topics, how de how we deconstruct it, or how we're part of building those, cementing basically those discourses that are. So how do you how do you see that? How have you been navigated kind of the, 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 the uh, this idea of impact in your work? Um, I, I think I just uh, let it go in a lot of ways. I, I, I mean, I find, for example, working with you is great because there's an alignment in terms of uh, the value of the film changing discourse or the value of the film in context where it's about dialogue. It's not about a kind of, and, and I, I don't think activist films are wrong. Like those films definitely have a place and I'm not against those films. Um, I don't make them. And and it cannot be the only way in which we measure films, uh, measure their kind of uh, effectiveness, right? So I think, like you said, for me, to make a film that, that situated you in that moment of so much violence and let you sit in it and stay in it and think about it and kind of experience it, that was my goal. And, and it was also a time when images of violence in Mexico especially were super common and sure. they still are. And the press was kind of over flooded with these images. And I remember when I was shooting, there was a death of a, of a no, it was a big death and they had put a head on a tomb, a kind of decapitated head and put a flower in the ear. Hmm. And I remember writing about it and thinking about that the person who did that knew that would get photographed and that that photograph would have a certain I impact of violence through the media. So how do you not participate? It's a difficult question because a lot of filmmakers <laughs> are part of that. Um, El Velador uh, sort of takes your, takes your um, your work to, 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 to other festivals and other settings. Uh, you know, um, uh, you shot new directors in films um, uh, at Cannes, kind of, it, it seems like it opened new doors for you. And uh, did all these doors that opened that kind of led you to make your first, to make your first fiction film or what was that decision to make a, make a, a truly fiction film? Even though it's, a, even though it has a lot of non-fictional elements, of course. I know, I think it was that making El Velador felt like making fiction because <laughs> um, it was so weird, one. But also, it was such a set routine. So I knew at what time of day the <laughs> night watchman was going to arrive in his truck. I knew how he would make his bed. I knew how his life was exactly. So I could start to like storyboard in my head how I was going to film. And then there was also this element more narratively about we don't learn anything about El Velador. Like you don't know how many kids he has, you don't know where he lives, you don't know anything about him. So he's kind of this open character, right? He's a character who's at the function of the place and of his work. And it doesn't mean he's not, he's dehumanized. Like I think he's, he's very human, but his humanity is not his context or his full context, his life, like mm -hmm. his biography. So all of that, felt like fiction to me. And then add to that all these issues I was having around how do I film people <laughs> and hold that responsibility of the kind of documentary relationship. I was just very happy to make a fiction film. <laughs> <laughs> and I was and, uh, sorry. had this idea at the time of kind of making a set of films about, about violence. And I really wanted one to be about bureaucracy and that is very hard to film just to get access. Mm -hmm. I was never going to get access into an office like Doña Flor's office in Mexico to shoot. Sure. It's never going to happen. What was the biggest challenge of making this film when making uh, everything else? I don't know. All of it. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, I mean, 
mean, it had its, its great and difficult times. I think for me, you know, I'd made El Velador really by myself. And then suddenly I had a crew. I had a DP. I'd never worked with a photographer. Um, that was so just all those people to have to tell them what I was thinking and hmm. communicate ideas to was, was hard for me. Um, Adriana Barraza was amazing. And, and working Good. with her made me feel like I wanted to do more fiction. Um, hmm. It was just incredible that we could, you know, she would, we didn't rehearse a lot or at all. And we did, she looked at a lot of the writing I did early on as I was building the script. Um, and so she really had a hold on the character. And she did things like she went to buy a lot of her own wardrobe. And it was a way like to, to build her own character. But we never like, uh, yeah, we didn't exactly rehearse. But when she would do her her takes, which were also often improvised because they were with non-actors, um, just the level of detail that we could talk about in terms of like, what kind of anger are you expressing? It's not just anger. Is it frustration? Is it resentment? Is it bitterness? Mm -hmm. Like those are all very different. And Adriana has this ability, you know, to gesture and to use her body and her kind of facial expression to such incredible um, nuance. I find it mind blowing that, you know, she was nominated for an, for an Oscar for um, Babel Battle by Alejandro González and, 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 and everything else was her first starring role. I mean, it's crazy that that uh, Oscar nominated actress can't be offered a um, starring role. Uh, it's crazy, like you have to a whole decade and, and, and she's amazing. She's really, really amazing. Well, and so much of the roles that she's had have been made, you know, she was in Cake with Jennifer Aniston and she was the maid and, um, you know, um, just before we move to the um, to your more, more recent film, I, I was always curious about um, your premise of a film that you, uh, in terms of gender, that you wanted to make a film about a woman that was not uh, um, conditioned by her relationship to, uh, no, uh, ex basically, yeah. Can you tell us? Can you tell the audience about it? Yeah, because women are almost always mothers or wives or prostitutes or. You know, it's like we're still in Octavio Paz land of <laughs> yeah. la virgen o la puta. Like, you know, we're always in relation <laughs> to a man. And so um, I really, really wanted to have this character who just is. She's, she is the woman she is. Um, and then to kind of portray her as this uh kind of function of a machine and and it was interesting to me because i swam in mexico city at a pool that belonged to hacienda which is the like mexican irs and so the people who'd worked with, with in government in that government office could go there for very little money and so when i would go swimming all the women in the locker room were these kind of older bureaucrats and i hadn't hadn't actually like realized how little access I had to the to these people and how I didn't really see them. Right? Like when you go to get your voting card or passport or <laughs> they don't exist. And then to see them at the pool, like naked in the bathrooms and like selling creams to each other and they were so fleshy and human and and that interested me as a character like this person who really in the eyes of society is is invisible it's just that person you deal with and don't see and then to see this other side and the place where i swim is just fantastic it's where we filmed and i loved the bathrooms and the visually and there's a very direct connection to your short films your first short film huh? Yeah. Well, what it has a perfect memory in terms of the use of water and loss and uh, and, and memory, you know. Yeah. It, well, we repeat ourselves a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a, a question uh, from the audience in terms of uh, everything else. How did you navigate the switch from nonfiction to fiction? And what kind of atmosphere did you want to carry across from your nonfiction films to your fiction? 
Well, I'm not sure if this is the right answer to the question, but one of the things that struck me as I was preparing to make Todo Lo Demás is that I did a lot of reading on acting because that was my real fear. It was like, how am I ever going to direct an actor? And I was scared of actors. And and it was very clear to me that in fiction, the performance is key. Like, you can have a fantastic script, you can have a fantastic camera, and if you don't believe the performance, it's over. <laughs> so, whereas you can have a great performance, and if the camera is so-so, it's okay. You'd rather have a great camera, but if you don't, if you really connect to that character, you can still hold a film together. So I was really nervous about how I would direct actors. And as I was reading, there was so much common language between the books on acting and the books on documentary uh, that I suddenly felt much more confident. It was, and I realized like I'd spent all these years looking at people through the camera and I knew when I was looking at someone and I could tell when I could trust them. I could tell when I was seeing something sincere and I could tell when it was bullshit, right? And it was so clear. <laughs> when you, and, and any, I think any documentarian will say that to you. You can totally tell when someone's bad acting. <laughs> so once I kind of understood that, bringing that into, into the um, fiction was, gave me confidence. Right, that I would be able to know. And at the end, that's fantastic, but I also had all these non-actors that I had to evaluate. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's a good time to bring up. I read somewhere that uh, you were comparing uh, filmmaking, you know, fiction filmmaking to musicians and how they improvise. Uh, so it seems you're also making a, a correlation, even in the fiction world, no? Like it seems so, yeah. Um, but, um, um, Adriana would anchor precisely kind of a scene, but then it was improvising in working with with all these non-actors, no? Yes, but I think I was probably talking more about um, El General or El Velador in terms of thinking about improvisation or, and what I was thinking about was um, what, how you think about duration and how mm -hmm. you think about, uh, yeah, I, I, I was I was dating someone who's a, a jazz musician, and it was so I got a lot of exposure to jazz, and the kind of improvised jazz where for parts you're just like this is just chaos, it's so <laughs> unenjoyable, like I don't I don't like this, I don't like it, and then in that chaos would come a melody or something recognizable that would feel so pleasurable because what had come before wasn't. And so I was thinking about that kind of tension and release that happens based on duration and based on comprehension also. Um, in, in that, that that was the way I experienced improvised jazz. Um, how you can work with that in film. Right. And that's since you've you've edited all the all of your films, right? Uh, yeah. So did you did you take a lot of cues from from jazz music in terms of how to edit? Was it in, well, in, in this regard? Yes, but think about you know, especially working in my films often with with duration. How long do you hold a shot? Right. Um, my films are very inefficient. I don't cut as soon as you get it, and so that duration is about. Okay, it can be about a couple things. And one is, I know that you're going to look at the shot and you're going to see, I don't know, there's Carlos on the screen, right? And then if I hold it longer, you might be like, oh, it looks like Carlos didn't shave today. Oh, <laughs> I hold it longer. Oh, there's some books in the background. A and those layers of reading only come with time, right? So, so thinking about duration, almost like edit, I could I could do the same thing by cutting to those different things as like cutaways, right? But I can also hold the shot and trust that you're going to navigate through it. And the longer, and then there's this other aspect that's like, there'll be a point in which you'll start to wonder like, why am I still here? Why am I still looking at this thing? And when you cut, that cut is going to have a feeling to it. And, and that can be a kind of action. 
or narrative element, just the cut itself. But that has to do with how long you were in the space you were in previously. And that was the, for me, and I know this might not be true for anyone else, and especially not a musician, but <laughs> for me, that was the improvised jazz, right? That the discomfort, how long are you going to hold that discomfort, or how long am I going to keep you in the chaos? And then as soon as that melody comes in, you're going to feel a sense of relief. In another recent interview, <laughs> actually, I was reading a variety interview about your new film, and you and you and you say that the, making a fiction film took all the fear you had. Uh, I guess uh, in order to make a, this new film, uh, what exactly were you referring in terms of uh, those fears? Well, I think what's was really scary, aside from working with actors, is also that when you shoot a fiction, you have six weeks, and it's a ton of money. At least we had six weeks, and it's like you're just pouring all that money out. <laughs> And all these people are dependent on you. And if you didn't get, you know, the shots that you needed in that set when you had it, it's gone. And the stakes are really high in a very abbreviated amount of time, unless you get to work like Carlos Regadas or, or a few other directors who kind of get more time and more freedom. I didn't have that. So, so I felt that pressure and, and kind of going through it and learning to deal with it and learning how to communicate to other people what I wanted and kind of be the boss in that way that women usually are taught not to be. <laughs> Just made me feel like, okay, I can, I can, I can do whatever. Um, in terms of scale, in terms of scope, in terms of, um, yeah. Scale of scope, it's, you're still working with limited budgets, no? So how do you, was it the case with the new film too, or, I, or you I, had a little more budget than than, than with, with previous films? I had I had more of a budget than I did with my fiction for users, and it's thanks to finally having producers. <laughs> I worked with uh, Josh Penn and Elizabeth Lodge Sepp, and they really came to the table, <laughs> and are fantastic, fantastic producers. That, and I never had that kind of producer work with me. I'd worked with Daniela La Torre, who's worked on all my films. Um, right. But we kind of grew up together making films, kind of different story. Anyway, so so Josh and Liz really pulled through financially. Um, it's the first film I've done that has equity. Mm -hmm. Because we had a piscina to do all of Todo lo demás, so Mexican government grants. And all my previous films were totally funded by grants. So users had a, a mix of private and Invest, I mean, of investment and um, and grants. Going back to what I was saying earlier, in terms of taking risks, uh, uh, and and uh, again, for me, it's very important uh, in your filmography. Like you, you know, um, with each film, you go different places, uh, and 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 you have that artistic freedom to take the to make the the films and the way you want, uh, which is huge. Uh, because there's a lot of pressure again from the funders, from the producers, from the film world in general to um, to push filmmakers to do certain kind of film, films. And also, uh, I think there's very little talk about this. Uh, uh, you know, everybody, everybody's talking about having your breakthrough, but what, what happens when you have that breakthrough? Um, what happens when you're validated? Sometimes it's even harder because then, you know, because then people want to want you to make the same film, but different, have the same elements, but, and, and, and you, in every film, have you know have make, made different things and and that, that led me even to users which is about even a much more different film than your previous ones well, the, well i think that this idea of the breakthrough for latina happens like over and over again like <laughs> i broke through with el velador and i broke through with todo lo demás it's like, you never have broken through you're always it's like you're always emerging you've never emerged <laughs> when is it when am I going to stop emerging like <laughs> and, and you know maybe that can keep me feeling young I don't know <laughs> um, but yeah so so it's funny thing because you had asked a couple times like well what did the you know the Sundance Directing World Award for El General what did that do to your career what did mm -hmm. and the thing is that it's never felt from my subjective place any one thing has made all the difference. 
or like once I got that, then everything fell into place and I, you know, it was easy or um, it's just, yeah, it doesn't. Is it, is it still as difficult as, as since you first film uh, pretty much or, or some things have become easier or not? Well, I think I, I probably have amazing producers because I have that body of work. So they're willing to support me and they help me find funding that I wouldn't have found on my own. Um, I, you know, with users, I was able to get more development money, which is something I couldn't in the past. Or I was very fortunate to have the MacArthur and then um, Chicken and Egg Breakthrough grant which are these grants that allow especially the in-between films like they give you the money to kind of sustain yourself as you raise money to make another film uh, so <clears throat> i mean it i'm sure things have gotten easier if nothing else because i have more confidence i also understand that it's difficult so i don't panic and i don't take all the rejections they come just as often but i don't take it as personally i think um And I just have, just because of experience, a little bit more faith in the process. Like, okay, this is going to be hard. Who knows where the money's going to come from? But it will come. And the distribution, like, each film will find its path. And it's not about, I mean, it is about each film, but it's really about a whole body of work. And it's about making the next film. That's usually all I care about. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not the so, same. Uh, It's not the same. I guess few people on the audience have seen the new film because it has uh, only played in a few festivals um, yet. Um, but it's, uh, I mean, it's really impressive. Uh, it's, it's, it's uh, I'm really at all how you have, through your five films, you have really mastered um, your film language and uh, you take you take your work to a whole different level. You know, it's like an epic uh, operatic essay film on a very personal and close um, topic. Uh, and, um, Can you tell us how difficult it was working with your family? Because, uh, you know, your two children are the <laughs> subjects of a film. Uh, your husband is a sound designer. Um, your brother-in-law was a, a DP. So <laughs> it was all in the family. How, was, how difficult was that, working, working with your family? Oh, it's, it's a mix. I mean, I, I think sometimes I think, like, what would I do married to a doctor or a lawyer? Or, <laughs> right? Like, how would that work? <laughs> Um, so it's great to be with somebody who, and you know, and throughout my life, but it's great to be with someone who's creative. And while working together is challenging, it is also an opportunity to see my partner in a different light and to communicate in a different way and to appreciate and value how talented he is. Um, and this film, so, you know, I, I had my first kid in 2016 and Elias in 2018 and in July, and we started filming in October. So he was about three months old. And the yeah. very first thing we shot was Elias in that little, that smart crib. Uh, mm -hmm. And it has always been the first shot in the film. Which has never happened to me, but it, it always, just, <laughs> that was just where it belongs. But I feel that, you know, I was just afraid of having kids as a, as a, for a lot of reasons, but afraid of losing my career. Of, um, it's just very hard. It's hard to see how it's going to work when you don't have kids. And, and so I, I, as I thought about it, I really felt like, okay, I've got to figure out how to take all this change and the way that having the kids is shifting the way that I relate to the world and the way I see the world, that that is what my films are about. They are the way in which I understand the world and express myself about it. And so this can't be separate from that. And that having the children gives me an opportunity to, to explore these things differently. Um, And then Dave's dad is uh, one of the, the people who invented the internet. 
so suddenly I'm living in San Francisco and I'm in a family that is in technology and Dave's relationship to technology is so intimate that all of it just felt like I want to make a film about all of that. And then these questions that come up when you're a parent that it's like, do I show my kid the screen or do I not? Do I use a smart crib? Do I not? Like you're constantly hmm. faced with these very banal questions that you can't just answer them and move on and answer them from your gut of like, uh, you know, of course I'm going to put the, you know, a cartoon for my kid on the airplane so they don't bother everybody. Like that can be a gut feeling and that's fine. But for me, it was like, oh, this is an opportunity to like, explore and then think like well what happens if i put the kid in front of the cartoon on the plane and and to really kind of it was a little bit like making a general where i would let these things that were in my life kind of trigger association um so all of that and and i think in a lot of ways feeling a little bit um i miss mexico a lot living in San Francisco and, and I don't feel the kind of deep connection I feel to Mexico. So I feel a little bit unrooted or, and so making a film that in a lot of ways is also without geography. It's not as much about people as my other films in terms of how I engage with the world. And I think it has a lot to do with kind of how I feel here. It's about alienation as well, no? Yeah. Some kind of alienation with technology. Um, the use of sound, uh, and actually throughout your films, but but I, I guess probably even even more evidently here. Uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's it, you put a lot of attention to to your sound design. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on, on terms of how you know what the importance of sound for you in the in filmmaking? Yeah, I, I've always thought it very important, and it's not an area where I have a lot of practical talent. <laughs> so it's all Dave, and Dave is amazing. He, I think, I mean, I'm biased, but, you know, we would we would work on the sound design as we were shooting the film, and it was a combination of using sounds that we recorded in the field, and then Dave was writing the music and also creating sounds. Um, and he's a very agile moving between things. He also worked as an editor. And so he's, he can, he can like very organically and intuitively create sounds that combine kind of soundscapes with music and really work with image. And he's just incredible. And so we, we knew, and it's one of the things we talked a lot about was also creating images that would give space to the sound, right? So often what creates the, the movement in the image is not the image itself, but it's actually the sound that's propelling you in one direction or another. Um. One of the, I mean, the, the film, uh, uh, it's, a, it's an essay about technology and our kind of fascination and um, our fears, our f philosophical and moral fears with technology. The big irony is that because of the pandemic, um, you basically premiered online at Soundtons. <laughs> uh, kind of, it's a, it's a big irony of, or, or you know, how, how do you, how have you lived if this, uh, what, four, five months almost of, 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 of the life of the film remotely? It's very disappointing. I mean, I think I have so many feelings about it, but I think that the, the guiding thought that I think is the valuable one, <laughs> when we decided to submit to Sundance was for me that the film was ready. We had to push a little bit, but it was ready. And to wait just for the pandemic to end because we didn't want to be in the situation we're in, to me felt like that is not my job as an artist, right? Mm -hmm. My job is to engage in the now <laughs> with life as it is whether I like how it is or not. And it is a film that is conceived for the theater. It's, you know, it's in Atmos sound. It's visually meant to be on a big screen. It's meant to be, you know, if you're not focused on the film, it's a terrible film to watch because it's very slow and 
and meandering. But but you know, I, I watch it, I watch it in this in this screen and, and I believe it was not the case. I mean of course I'm dying to say it on, on the on the big screen, but but this too. <laughs> it was not my experience. And if you're like cooking dinner and doing fifty other things at the same time, <laughs> it, it's not like you can just jump right back into the story and and um, the film is asking you to be with it. So and the computer and the way that we engage with our screens is not often a hundred percent. Um, but so the two things I feel were important was one was to say, well, like, this is, this is the time, this is my time. And even if I don't like it, it is, it is my job to engage with it. And, and then I felt that this pandemic has forced us all to reckon with technology one way or another. And it's in everything from the dependence on Zoom and, and video chat and screens to communicate and feel some sense of connection, right? To our faith that there would be a vaccine, right? In another time in history, we didn't know what a virus was or we wouldn't have known what kind of cure or solution there might be. But we live in a time where there was pretty much faith that a vaccine would be developed. So all of us, I think, in our own ways are reckoning, reckoning with our relationship to technology. And in that, <coughs> I think we both see the hope and that it's incredible the things that we've been, you know, humankind has been able to imagine and create. Um, it's amazing. You know, and yet we can see its shortcomings, right? I would much rather be in person. <laughs> <laughs> Right, it's it's nicer to see your relatives than not always, but <laughs> anyway. Uh, some of them. <laughs> yeah, we, we live in um, and that it's a time in which we can also kind of consider what the unintended consequences might be. So I think it, but it's like we're in in a time that really allows us to live with that that ambiguity, which is what the film is really about. So hopefully, someone watching the film now is bringing all of that into the, the viewing of the film. Great. We're running out of time. Um, there's two specific questions from the audience. Uh, one from, I guess, from a, um, um, a young filmmaker uh, from Elian Islas and um, sort of kind of general, do you have any suggestions in terms of who to approach or how to approach um, someone uh, you know, to make a film or how to, how to approach people, I guess, or how to approach uh, when you have an idea to make a film uh -huh. and a made one, I just, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I think everybody kind of marks out their own path, but I feel like, I think one of the issues I have with film school or is this idea that you have to have like your proposal and clarity about your whole project, or you have to have funders in order to kind of start and, it doesn't totally make sense all the time. Like sometimes you don't know what your film is gonna be until you start working on it. And sometimes you know, you, you know, when you think about it, like why should anybody give you money if you've never made anything, right? So, so how can you work independently? How can you work, you know, make films that don't cost as much money or work with people, your, your peers, right? Who, and share, you know, exchange work hours or, um, yeah, I just, yeah. But I, you know, I think it, the, the bigger question is, you know, how, how do you, how, and how do you have the confidence to just make your films, to know that you want to make films, to know what films you want to make and to do it. Right. And so and that the, the proposal process and the raising the money process is kind of not an excuse to not do that. Where do you grab your own confidence? Because uh, you know, it's hard, I guess. Uh, where do you draw your own confidence? Or and, and looking back in retrospective, where you know, what are the sources of confidence for you? Um, I mean, I think this goes back to talking a little bit about where we come from in our background. And I feel like I was really lucky that I went to a very privileged boarding school for high school. 
and um, I was told like every day at that school how great we were, and that we were people who would do amazing things and uh, whatever it was at the time that we would be the ones to find the cure for AIDS and we would be the ones to, um, and, and that's empowering to hear those things, you know, and, and if you don't get that from your family, uh, if you don't get that from school, if you don't get that from your community, and I think that this is where the real struggle for most Latinx filmmakers is, that if we're coming from being marginalized in society, that sense of empowerment or entitlement to do something is, is most likely less present. Like I had this interesting experience pitching users and uh, you know, I would say, oh, it's a film about technology and everybody we pitched to knew exactly what I was talking about. They had an idea. No one was like, what's that? Right? And they would immediately say, well, that's so fascinating. Of course, you're going to look at biotech. And then they would talk about biotech. Or, of course, you're going to look at robotics. And they would talk about robotics. <laughs> <laughs> so, Everybody would just project whatever they wanted to. And this is so relevant. And this is so, it's such an important film. Right? <laughs> and it was like, oh, this is what it feels like to make films that are in the center. Right? It's so affirming. And so if you think about not having that because you're making a film about a community that is not in the center or that nobody has heard about or that, that's marginalized in one way or another, when you lose that opportunity to feel that whatever you're working on is worth anything, right? And instead your pitches are about, well, what is it? Where is that? And what is that? And who cares about that? And, and who's your audience, right? The big one. <laughs> <laughs> that's devastating, you know, especially as it, for a young filmmaker. Um, so if you didn't get in your family a sense of empowerment or in your school or in your community, then where do you find that, right? I got it in places in my background uh, that where I had a lot of privilege in certain things. Um, but I do think that that is a huge challenge. You know, we're going over time, but uh, but I see also the opposite happening, uh, particularly in film schools. Uh, you know, particularly here in New York, uh, um, you know, they they it's a lot about, about the ego. So uh, it's uh, it's about also raising the bars and expectations. So a lot of uh, you know. Uh, I've seen many, many students coming out from those universities, from those film schools, that they get disappointed very quickly because the world is not that as they taught in the school. So anything is, it's, it's it, you know, you know, if, if, if it's about expectations and if they meet expectations, they're like, you know, unsuccessful. So, and that, and that's a very heavy thing for a lot of filmmakers, uh, for a lot of filmmakers and, and, and aspiring filmmakers, particularly. The expectation to succeed, like that you'll get exactly, exactly. If you go to a film school, you know NYU, Columbia, you almost deserve this and this and this. And if that doesn't happen, or it doesn't happen the way you're expecting, you know, you feel like uh, you feel like you're going nowhere. Yeah, it seems like also like it could be a, a big burden. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I can. You didn't go with the film school. school, <laughs> and I, I just look at the people I know making films that I admire, my peers. They just work mm -hmm. really hard, and they don't let the disappointment stop them. They, they're okay. passionate about what they do, um, and they work really hard. And it means doing a lot of things you don't want to do. It's not all the fun part of filmmaking. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. The other practical question, uh, someone from Mexico, where can they see your films in Mexico? Oh, that's been my downfall, has been <laughs> making sure my films are available. And they're, they are hard to get. Um, so, so, yeah, I don't have an answer. At least uh, everything else is available through Cinema Tropical sites. Uh, or is it available for Mexico? I can't remember now. Anyway, right. if not, up, we'll, we'll post it. We'll, we'll post it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they're hard to get. 
um, piano distributed, todo lo demás. El velador did broadcast on television um, and then was on a VOD platform. Um, El general broadcast on television. Uh, but they've not had in Mexico that they don't have, we don't have like the educational distribution distribution that you have in the US, that model right. out there. And um, all those films were also made before kind of big streamers were on available. So El General, you know, wouldn't sure. have gone to a, a Netflix in 2009. Like that was not <laughs> the way it right, was. Right, part of the equation. Right. Mm -hmm. Or Amazon or any of those. So I feel like in, in a lot of ways I've, been stuck in a in a limbo in that way of in a lot of oh, you're long you're long overdue for a uh, for a retrospective uh, both in the U.S. and and in Mexico. So hopefully there's a chance to do a whole retrospective of your work. Uh, you know, again, uh, it's been very influential and uh, and again, you know, uh, we're using these twenty years of cinema to pick up precisely to look back and 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 there's a lot of things to celebrate. You know. Yeah. Uh, five five wonderful feature films to celebrate and um, to go to come back to it and and also with what's going on uh, in Mexico and particularly with such topics I mean they're as timely as ever. Yeah, I mean it's been great. I feel like when I started making films, I felt like there were so few film like to be a filmmaker in Mexico was was a kind of exception. Whereas it, there are lots of filmmakers in the U.S. But I really felt like. In Mexico, we needed someone to make documentaries, and there weren't many women doing them. And now we have amazing women documentary filmmakers in Mexico, and a whole, you know, because of Ambulante also, like this whole culture around documentary film that 20 years ago really did not exist. And there was really mm -hmm. only like educational TV documentary, and now it's it's a whole art form that's developed, and, and that's exciting. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, I feel like I've gotten to be in a really exciting time for documentaries in terms of what's happened over the last 20 years. And also the irony, you know, uh, kind of the, the, the places uh, shift. Now it's so much difficult to make a career in the US than in Mexico, <laughs> or I mean, there's a, or uh, at least to last, uh, to, 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 to last year, uh, I think there was, it was easier and then, you know, there was like a new generation of Mexican filmmakers that emerged. Yeah, I mean, in Mexico, there is a clear source of money. Right, and that has totally changed what gets made and who makes films. Or that that there's government money that you can get your whole film funded is incredible. Like there's nothing like that in the states. In the states, you kind of have to piece it together from a lot of different parts, and you're either pushed with the kind of grant and foundation pressure, or now the equity side that has a commercial pressure. Right. Whereas in Mexico, the government grant is free from a lot of pressures. It's, it's a lot of work and it has its own issues, but you're not forced to commercialize your work in the way you might be here. So it's just, it's a very different setup, but between the film schools that are fantastic and the support from the government to make films, Mexico's had a thriving film community for, I don't know what year if you seen this started, but 15 years. 2002. Yeah. Three, Mm -hmm. and change great well natalia yeah. such a great pleasure i mean we, <laughs> i guess we can continue talking but uh um uh, we cover a lot of ground uh always a, a pleasure um and of course uh, i highly 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 recommend all of your films but uh, even more the the new one uh users so be on the lookout for it and uh good luck with the with the uh, with the second part of a, of a, uh, the distribution and all the all the complexities to to to, to make the films um, get seen by a larger audience, and uh, looking forward to your future projects. Thank you. Gracias. A ti, al contrario. <laughs>